Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. It is a pleasure to be with you. I just heard that we are number 50 in all of self-improvement in New Zealand, a country I'm really wanting to go travel to. We're very high in Vietnam and Slovakia. We are, gosh, under 200 in all of self-improvement in the USA. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show and showing up and listening now more than ever. This number one transformation conversation is really important and what an amazing free resource for you. You know, if you are listening to this on podcast and you are digging what you hear, you can watch me and my guests. You can go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and enjoy us there. I've had a lot of people write in and say, you're right. I actually checked out your YouTube channel and it is pretty boss to see you and your guests. It kind of made a big difference. So I'm a very visual person that works for me. We have been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards. You can subscribe to the show, and I recommend you do, and it'll come right into your inbox. And it's syndicated on over 40 outlets, both radio and podcast, also iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora, et cetera. Please leave a review. I want to offer a comment. I'm going to start doing this because I hear from so many of you, and I'm super grateful, <clears throat> who take the time to actually leave a review. So this one is from... Anita Sanchez, who wrote in, she was listening to the interview with James Redfield, and the conversation was Mysterious Coincidences, and she wrote, one of the best interviews yet. Glad I created the time to listen. Thanks to James Redfield and Debbie Dashinger for sharing such inspiring and practical info for us to be and to do what is our calling. Loved it. Thanks, Anita, for writing in. And if you write in, I promise I'm going to start sharing more of these so it's not just for my eyes or my team's eyes. And uh, welcome, everybody, to Dare to Dream. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane Here and Access Consciousness. They do extraordinary healing work out into the world, energy work. So if you want something changed like that, you can become a facilitator. You can go to one of their workshops. Obviously, they're doing a lot of things online now, and you can buy their products. Uh, there's lots of ways to connect with them. Go to Dr. Dane, D-A-I-N, here, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. My question to you is, do you want to learn the roadmap to meaning, success, and abundance? I know I do. My guest today is Corey Poirier, who is a multiple-time TEDx speaker and sought-after keynote. He has spoken on Mo Mondays and PMX stages. He shared the bill with some pretty cool people like John C. Maxwell, Deepak Chopra, Stephen Covey, and General Hillier. And he's presented to thousands of attendees. My friend Corey is the host of the top-rated Conversations with Passion radio show, for the Love of Speaking show, and he's the founder of the Speaking Program. Corey has been featured in multiple TV specials, and he's been seen on CBS, CTV, NBC, ABC, and he's been heard twice on the popular, on, I love this, Entrepreneur on Fire show. You go that you got to ask back. A columnist with Entrepreneur and Forbes, Corey has been interviewed on over 4,000. He has interviewed over 4,000 of the world's top leaders. You can visit him at his website, coreyporier.com, and it's C-O-R-E-Y, P as in Paul, O-I-R-I-E-R.com. And I welcome my fabulous friend, Corey, to the Dare to Dream show. Yay. Great to have and you. I am so excited to be here. And it's interesting that you Maybe this was a mysterious coincidence that you mentioned uh, James off the top. And I think we talked about, you know, with my book, James wrote the foreword and him and I are working on a big project together. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, that's not a coincidence that you picked that review to read. So I just think that's super cool. It is actually very strange because I didn't mindfully pick it. And yet I do know that his forward was in your book. And I have to say, I adore this guy. So please put in a big hello from me. Um, I, I can understand why you'd want to work with him. He's, he's a person for our times right now. And I want you to tell people, because that's so beautiful, a bio that you have, and it's pretty clear what you do. I like that. Will you explain, what do you serve up? <laughs> what's, what's Corey's dish du jour? What is the work you do out into the world? So it, it, when it started, the work that I did was really, I was going to, 
I'll, I'll say a speaker, a keynote speaker, really, because that most people have a feeling they've had a speaker at their event, they've been at an event with a speaker. So my core business for a long time was me going to speak in front of an association or a corporate client, then bringing me in, introducing me to their staff, and hopefully me educating, inspiring, and motivating their staff. That was how it all started. But then somewhere along the way, I got obsessed with interviewing people. So I started a newspaper, believe it or not, when I was 19, and it failed. I mean, it went, it went out of business. And, it, and I say it failed. It didn't go bankrupt or anything. I chose to close it, but I knew the writing was on the wall. Uh, a number of years later, I, when I was a full-time speaker, I said, you know, I could open the doors on this paper again. It was never closed properly. So I launched what I would call Similar to Success Magazine, a regional publication like that, and ran it for... Uh, I would say about close to seven years monthly. And what's really interesting, Debbie, is when people say to me, how did you get that many interviews in? It's not all on podcasts. Like it started with that mm -hmm. newspaper where I was doing some months, 80 interviews in a month. And so I had that newspaper running and that's kind of where I went from just the guy speaking on stages to realizing it could be so much more than this. And the interesting part of this whole journey for me is I expected it to continue down the path of, let's say, what... I, the best way I can say it is the thought leader path, like so what Zig Ziglar did, what Brendan Burchard does, uh, what Lisa Nichols does. I thought it would solely be that path at first. And then what happened kind of threw me off uh, course about five years ago is people started coming to me saying, how are you getting paid to speak on these stages? You know, I see that you're posting five times a week that you're speaking somewhere. And are you getting paid? And my answer was always yes. And they're like, how are you doing this? And at the time, I had been doing it about 12 years. And I thought it was normal. I thought everybody that was speaking was getting paid all the time. Like I knew obviously because I was a professional speaker, I knew people were selling from the stage. I knew other people were going and doing no fee bookings, but I thought everybody that put sought after speaker was getting paid to speak all the time. And you would be surprised that some of the people, the resume they had who weren't getting paid yet, who came to me and said, help. And after you get a question a certain amount of times, you're like, I need to start helping people in a bigger way than just answering one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so five years ago, I launched the speaking program which was kind of the catalyst for launching the podcast around speaking. And uh, also I launched a book called um, the book of public speaking. And ultimately uh, two years ago launched a program helping people land their branded talks like TEDx and stuff like that. So five years ago, this started pushing me in a different path than just me sharing my message with audiences to now helping other people get on stages and or use their written word to share messages with other people. So what I've sort of done is kind of like created the best way I can describe it is I'm trying to ultimately get to where it's almost like an influencer academy mm. and so helping people whether it's from the stage whether it's through their voice whether it's from through written word mm. I want to help have a small direct impact on them impacting a lot more lives so yes, that's how many people need this this is huge I know I have clients who come aboard who are like do you do speaking too? people are hilarious right do you have anything to do with visibility clearly you cover all of it no you do not so no, it's not my niche. So that's great because I'm actually even taking notes that I'll uh, probably invite you into a program I'm going to be running um, to introduce you to my people. And so many questions come up when I hear you say this. The first thing I want to cover is, Corey, were you ever afraid? So did you ever... Now it wouldn't be so. There's no way, not with how much you're speaking and this must be just secondhand. You know, you could light up a cigar and grab a glass of cognac and you're good. But was it always like that? So the answer is unequivocally no. It was not always like this. In fact, now I, here's the catch point too. I wasn't the guy, you know, because some people will say I was terrified of speaking. Nobody would have ever saw me as a speaker. I'll say that I think people may have saw me as a speaker because I was so social. I was very social. My mother, very talkative. I got that through and through. But just as you know, just because you're social doesn't mean you can get on a stage in front of people and talk. And so I was that guy where I was, I was in front of a group of 10 of my friends. I could be the life of the party. But to get on a stage and say something meaningful was a totally different business. And so I was that guy truly who... I spoke one time in front of a group of 10 entrepreneurs in a program I was in, and I turned shades of color. I uh, spoke in front of a group, it was about the difficulties young entrepreneurs face. It was an entrepreneurial association, and I was invited as a young entrepreneur, and I didn't prepare. And at the end, the person said, you know, you, you turned every shade of color except for the color you started with. And, and I was like, 
sweating and almost passing out. And then my third time in front of an audience was actually on a stage. I mean, there's a whole story behind this, but I get tricked into doing stand-up comedy, which doesn't make sense. How can you get tricked into doing stand-up? But I did. And so that was my third time ever in front of an audience. And it, it was horrible. Like I bombed, like I told my jokes to a dead audience, dead silence. And then we found out the mic wasn't turned on. I found out, turned the mic on, told the same jokes again, and they bombed again. So I'm like the only comic I think was bombed with the same material twice in 10 minutes. And that was my first three times on stage. So no, I was not comfortable. And do I still get nervous 100%? Really? But yeah, I do. But the difference is it's, um, what would you call it? A contained excitement. nervousness? It's an excitement, but it's a nervousness that I, it's almost like a comfortable nervousness. Like it's really nervousness. And you know, I'm sometimes depending on the audience, I could be even shaking inside, but it's still, um, it serves me. It does, I, I know it's going to be a nervousness that's going to serve me on the stage rather than something's going to keep me from the stage. So I can tell you this, after bombing at that stand-up comedy show, I started going back week after week. And I was, I was obsessed and I was bombing every week and I was sweating every week and I was almost passing out every week and I kept going back. So the one thing I can tell you is since that time, I've never said I was going to be at a stage and then didn't get up on the stage. Mm -hmm. So even TEDx, which is like the most nerve wracking stage ever, I, can I still, I was terrified. I still get up. Like there were, so what I can tell you is even though, yes, the nervousness never left. Yes. I started off as somebody who can't get on, couldn't get on stages at all. Now the one difference is I can tell you, I'll never live with regret that I didn't step on a stage. I planned mm -hmm. to step on. I so, love that. No regrets. That's really powerful, really powerful. And it's really powerful to bomb at something and then make it your mission to go back and become an expert at it. Like make it your mission. Like I'm going to do this and be this. And now you are. I so mean, even telling the story of bombing, I think it's hilarious. Well, I have to tell you, I actually share that story when I open some of my speaking engagements, but I shared a story recently on our show uh, with my girlfriend who became my guest for a few weeks as we were getting ready to launch the new book. And I shared a story that she had never heard. So I'm going to share it because I've never shared it publicly other than recently on my show. But people always ask me, how did you get on the stage that night? And, you know, and like I say, Debbie, there's a whole like 10 minute story behind the whole situation. And it started because I asked somebody, how can I get comfortable on stages? And they said, oh, did you hear about the local workshop and stand up comedy? And I'm like, that sounds terrifying. Yeah, let's do it. Because you're going to face the fear. And so here's where here's what ha helped me do it. So I'm sitting there and we're about 15 minutes of show time. We didn't know this is the trick part. We didn't know we were going to be on the stage that night. He didn't tell us it was us. He actually told us we were promoting the show for other entertainers. And then when we questioned him, he said, no, yeah, Corey's going to be on stage and, and Bill's going to be watching. So Corey's the other entertainer while Bill's sitting down. So he just had this whole thing about tricking us to perform that night. Mm. But here's the thing. So people say, how did you do it? Like you were that terrified. Here's what popped in my head and I can't explain it. Again, maybe it's a mysterious coincidence or it was meant to happen some way, shape or form. But what I, what I did was I visualized myself sitting at that bar as an older Corey, mm -hmm. watching other people get on a stand-up comedy stage that night and saying, you know, I almost did that one time. And the fear of the regret of not doing it was so much bigger than the fear of doing it, I had no choice but to do it. So it was that vision that pushed me to do it that night. O-M-G. But that I never shared that. I forgot about that until recently. And I'm like, why am I not sharing this with people? Because that's what happened in my head. And I thought it was weird to have that vision, but it served me, I guess. That is a powerful vision. What, what a vision to have. And I can imagine that for so many things, people who are listening that they want to create. And I, of course, you know, dare to dream. I've taught dreams. I've written books about dreams and achieving. I know this. Uh, and why do I know it intimately? Because I have it too. And I know the idea of this giant, yummy, inspirational thing popping from your belly into your 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 head and your mind and like all of what's possible and you're there and it's fabulous and all of a sudden the hitch starts yeah but you know you can't because of this yeah but you know if you do that what and all the what ifs and the why nots come up and that becomes the prevalent picture and so i have my ways of assuaging that so i don't have to live in that space because that'll take me down every time that'll become my truth that'll become the real picture and i know i cannot live that way and i love that you're giving us a tool right here saying what if you were the person sitting whether it's a bar stool or whether you're just watching the movie of your life right once you've passed over or you're at the your end days and you say yeah i almost went on that trip yeah, I almost told that person I loved them. 
Yeah, I almost wrote that book. Ugh, painful. No one wants to live with regret. Like that's a, that's a bad R-E-G-R-E-T, six letter word. Really bad word. You know, uh, you probably witnessed this because you've interviewed so many people. What, what I've noticed is, and it, it, I noticed this early on, but it hasn't changed, is that regret for most people is worse than failing by 10, you know, a million miles, I'll say. Uh, people, when they come on, especially people that are maybe influencers that are like 70 plus, uh, you know, we had Jack Canfield on the show a few years ago. He was 69, I think, at the time. And that was something he talked about is that, you know, in all his years when he's watched people that he knew along the way, that they usually regret, the stuff they regret is bigger than the stuff that they tried and failed at. You know, they have, the regret, they're like, you know what? I wish I would have tried that and failed because the regret's eaten me alive. Yeah. So I think regret is always worse than trying and failing. Yeah, because you could have, you know, you could have, and you know, you will never know the possibilities if you had. So yeah, that's very painful and nobody needs that. Um, really. Uh, I, and I'm so deep into that, both as a healer who says, you know, the, one of the most important things we can do on the planet is to our excuses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to express ourselves. I think expressing ourselves, like I've made that, you know, I, I had a couple of people very meaningful to me die in my life. My grandparents really helped raise me, very important in my life, outstanding human beings. Like I'm very much like my grandfather. I get a lot of what I do, he was um, international who's who of music. He wrote books, he spoke all around the world. He was an amazing personality, a great listener and all of that. And I love my grandfather deeply. And I have to say when they died, it was like, um, I knew I couldn't let them leave with a song in my heart, meaning I had to tell them how I felt. I was really very, uh, very expressive about my love and everything they'd meant. And I've done that with everybody, thankfully, who's ever passed. And then I've learned, okay, and about the living, you know, that too. You've got to express yourself at the least. But even for a lot of people with regret, they don't say, they don't forgive, they don't um, tell the truth, you know. And I think all of that's as important as dreams. I really do. Um, so, yeah, you can tell I'm, I'm somewhat passionate about this subject. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, uh, if this helps and serves people, People ask me all the time, and it's something I, I started, I didn't start it right away in the book, but early in the book, I mentioned this because I think it's so important, but I often ask an audience, how many people here have a personal mission statement? And I can tell you, I can ask that in a room of a thousand people and only two hands go up. Mm -hmm. And I find it interesting that the top companies have a powerful mission statement that's easy to remember and they all know it. And when I say they all know it, I mean the employees know it even if they don't know what the wording is. So like Disney knows you're supposed to have every person leave the park happy. You know, so, so even if they get things wrong, if long as most of their cast members, as they call them, uh, get that, then they're going to have a better day than an organization where they don't know at all what they're supposed to be doing. And so I find it interesting that most people don't have a personal mission statement, even though we know it's why most companies succeed, because they know what they're supposed to be doing and they're aligned. And so I talk about in the book, the importance of your own personal mission statement. And so mine is to be the guy who motivates, donates, inspires, educates, and entertains. That's my five point system. Now, why I bring this up is because this allows me to say no without regret and yes without regret. Because mm -hmm. here's what I do. When somebody asks me to take on something or to help them with something or to do something, I look and say, is it gonna serve most of those five? And if it is, and now, especially if we're talking business, but this serves my personal life as well. But if it's four of those five, it's the easiest yes ever, and I never regret it, and I know it's the right answer. If it's zero of those five, it's the easiest no ever, and I know I won't regret it. And so when we talk about not living with regret, that served me so well is to know what my mission statement is, because it serves, it's what moves the needle for me towards what I'm trying to achieve, and, and, and my bigger purpose, which by the way is to create a positive ripple indirectly and direct, or directly in uh, other people's lives every day. Powerful. And so, so knowing that, th those five things help me do that. And so if it's zero and somebody's saying, you need to do this because, but it's zero of those things. Like for example, they're like, we want you to come and speak, uh, but you can't educate people and you can't entertain and you can't get back. No, sorry. Somebody wants to come on a show. And, and none of those things you notice say me promoting myself. So if, if it could be the greatest show in the world and they say, we don't want you to promote yourself, that's fine. Because I'm still doing those five things. But if somebody says, we want you to come on our show, 
again, and, and it's not about educating people. It's not about inspiring. It's not about med- uh, motivating people. So you can't entertain them. Then me, it's like, why, why am I going to do this? It doesn't fit. It's not me. So that's how I choose. And that's how I walk away with the regrets now. That's anyway. really beautiful. You know, and, and speaking of promotion, oh, I, you know, so this is so interesting. You can't, <laughs> you could see pieces. This is like, um, here's pieces of his book. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, and there you go. You mirror me. But I want to say it's a beautiful book. Corey, I know you. And I have to say, I was kind of moved by how articulate you are. Oh, I, was, well, thank you so I, I didn't, this is going to sound so weird, but you're cr- incredibly bright. Like really, because okay. I teach book. I coach people how to write a book. I work with tons of authors. I've got a program that takes people to international bestseller, yada, yada. So this is like, I, I digest a lot of these. And I just got to say, that's the thing that struck me. I mean, it, it was a lot of care that you put into this book and how you presented it and what you chose to talk about. So thank you for that. I, I can really receive it. Well, I appreciate that. And I'll add one thing that uh, I don't share this much, but it probably surprises people, but maybe it's a tip for writers or actually anybody, but let's say for writers, uh, you'll probably notice the style I wrote in was a little bit of a throwback to the older style of writing, like Think and Grow Rich and uh, Magic of Thinking Big and How to Win Friends. Those are, that's, those are my, that's my jam, you know, those books. And so, and actually the first two books I ever read in my life, How to Win Friends and Think and Grow Rich, uh, first one was at age 27. So I didn't start reading early. And I have to say what I did was anytime I was sitting down to write, I actually went back and read a portion of those books to get myself in the mindset because that's my favorite style, but not most books aren't in that style. So I think it's, I, it wasn't intentional or planned or a strategic move, but people have said to me, geez, that's amazing. If I like a speaker, I don't want to obviously copy them. But if I like their style and I'm and my style similar, I probably should watch their talks. And you know, then I'm gonna if on a regular basis, so then I actually carry that with me. You know, I have some of that style with me. So anyway, that's that's something I did unintentionally, but it served me really well. No, that's you know amazing because I studied, you know, even as a coach, obviously you still get coached. So I went to a really high-end program and I worked with uh Stephen Kotler, for those who have ever read Stealing Fire and uh Pause, pray, small furry prayer and my god he's written so much he's amazing out in the world and I was such a fan and been on my show so I took his writing class and that's one of the things he teaches is you can open a book I don't want to give away his information but I'll just say to to utilize someone else's material to inspire you you're mm-hmm. never going to copy obviously that listeners <laughs> but I am saying that there is a vibration in how somebody writes in a rhythm and a way they express themselves and you can literally use the energetics of that to put your own message out it's sort of a beautiful container what Corey's talking about and I'm curious and thank you for sharing your mission because I know your book starts out that you share your mission and who you are and why you're here and you live a big life right you're a doer like I want to do that I'm going to make it happen how did you get James Redfield to write your forward? So, you know, this is, I'm going to say, it, it's an interesting question because I've, I've been asked this question quite a bit lately. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Much like the version you did, you have, we haven't added in the endorsement yet because a lot of them came in after the book was done. So we're actually working on changing that now. So I, I've been getting that question as well. So I'm going to give you the answer, the same answer for both. But people are asking, how'd you get John Gray to endorse the book? How'd you get T. Harv Ecker to endorse the book? And you know, there's two things. Here's that, that answer nobody wants to hear is, and you, you've done the same I thing. Asked. <laughs> is, well, well, no, but I mean, the other side is you put the time in. So one hand, one of the things is I built this over a long time. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to give value for a long time to a lot of people, but I'm going to give you a more a strategic answer than that. But I'm going to say that's one thing is there's really no, I, I, I don't think there's much of a shortcut for actually putting other people first. I don't think you can get as much buy-in if you just send and say, hey, do an endorsement for me. I, I think if the relationship is bigger before that, mm-hmm. then I think for them, they're going to want to read it. They're actually going to want to put the time in. They're going to want to say, what did Debbie do here versus just getting a book in the mail? So I'll answer it about James. What happened was, because James, important note here, James doesn't endorse many books or write many forwards. And so here's how it happened. And this is a mysterious coincidence. I told James this recently. He didn't know this. But how we got connected. It, I, it wasn't an accident, but it was amazing how it all came to place is my girlfriend has never asked me to interview anybody. So here I'm out interviewing all these people and she's a big, like she fangirls out over a lot of people. So I'm like, how are you not asking me? How do you not have a list? 
So one day I finally convinced her to put a list of five people together. That was all she put together. Here are these five people. One of them was David G. One of them was Tommy Rosen. But one was James Redfield. And James was the first on the list. And I said, so why James? And I knew of his work. And I'd read the book. But it was a little while. I was removed from it. And so I said, why James? And she said, well, that was the book that changed everything for me. You know, because it's the perfect age for her. She was in university, and she said it was the first spiritual style book she ever read. Like, the first book that in any way, shape, or form talked about Many energy. Us, yeah. That's true, yeah. Yeah, and so that was her thing. And so she said, so he impacted my life in such a big way. Mm. So the interesting part, now, people can't replicate this as much anymore because at the time, uh, James's email was on the website. And, his, and Sally, his wife's. So at the time, it was slightly easier because I was able to email. Uh, they didn't reply, but his daughter did. And so his daughter replied to me and said, you know, I got your request for the interview. I'd like to make it happen. Now, here's the part I want to tell people if you're looking for how do I get some names uh, to help me with projects is a big word called leverage. So what I've done was the hardest ones are always the first ones. But then, as you know, it's easier to leverage the influencers that do trust you for the next ones so as an example where it all started for me is jack canfield i actually approached jack's team it took four months to get the interview they told me at the time he turns down nine out of every ten because he wasn't working on any new projects and so most people would have given up but i don't i'm not most people so what i did was i listened to a success magazine interview with darren hardy uh interviewing uh dan sullivan who runs strategic coach and i heard dan in the interview say and i listened every month so it was just by nature, I heard the interview. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, he, Darren, so some of your clients are who's who. And he started listing to them. I think Joe Polish is one, Mark Victor Hansen, Jack Canfield. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm trying to get Jack on my show. Uh, this guy here who I, I didn't know who Dan was, Jack obviously looks up to him if he's Jack's coach. So I listened to the interview, and he said in the interview, this is one of my favorite interviews ever. And my interview style was like Darren Hardy's. So what I did at first is I went to Dan's office and said, I'd like to get Dan on the show. And he said Success Magazine was one of his favorite interviews. Ours is a similar style. So they were intrigued by that. And then, and I wanted Dan on the show anyway. I got him on the show, and here's where the rubber hits the road. What I did was I said, um, I started talking with Jack a little bit. And then he said, you know, you need to bring Jack on the show. He'd love this show. So then I took that clip, sent it to Jack's team, and said, even Dan <laughs> thinks Jack should be on the show. And then they came back the next morning and said, okay, okay, Corey, he said he'll do it. And then when it aired, this is the cool part of that story. The day before, he was on a rerun of Larry King Live. And the day after my show, he was on the old network on Super Soul Sunday. Oh. And in between, he was on my show that was just launching. We hadn't, by the way, we had, didn't have an episode yet. They didn't ask me listenership or anything. And so you see where that goes, right? Now we have Dan, now we have Jack. And then I was able to leverage those two to get the next guest. And then it's easier when you have three and then four. And so that's what happened. So by the time I approached James, I think, I don't know, but I didn't, and I always customize it. So I would look at who do I have that I've interviewed that are in the similar circle to James. And so I sent those names. And then when they said, yes, we did an interview. And this is the funny part. It was in a food court. I had to do the interview because I was on my way to the office and something happened in the way that slowed me down. So I did the interview in a food court and I said, you know, we're remote where stuff is happening. <laughs> I'm like, anyway, and I'm like, there's no way he's ever going to do an interview with me again. This is terrible. Anyway, they came back and said he loved your interview style. They didn't comment that he liked the quality of the sound, but he liked the interview style. And then I met him at the Life Conscious Expo intentionally, like I was going anyway. So I was there, reached out, we did our second interview in person. And then his daughter came back and said, Dad said he's got to be interviewed by you again. He loves your interview style. And so where it went from that is literally, we said, let's do a series. And we just started doing interview after interview. And so what I can truly say is that was quite a while ago now, like maybe three years ago. And so we're probably, what, 25 interviews in over time. And so the short answer now, after all that, is I built a relationship and, and I, would, I would say we're friends. I mean, we text on a weekly basis. So, it, but it built from that. But I mean, you probably saw a whole bunch of hints when people are saying, how do I do that in there? You need to leverage, you need to get some big names to start with. Uh, you need to be willing to put yourself out there. You need to be creative. Like again, I took the clip and sent it off. And then at the same time, you need to give value first. So there's maybe five tips for and how- I it gotta add a six because this is imperative. Then when they met with you, you had the goods. Right? Yeah. You had the talent, you had the synergy to connect with them. You had an interview style that made them say, I'd like to collaborate with you further. Sort of everything, because we can pull people in and we can create influential relationships. But if you show up empty handed, nobody wants to play anymore and it won't go further. But you had the goods and you've worked on it long enough. 4,000 people you've interviewed. That's very important. 
You put well, and I'll, I'll add one last component because this is important. <laughs> to serve James. Well, this one here is just more to, to, to speak for James in terms more of his fun. integrity. Okay. One of the things that he did, which I loved, is even after all what I just told you, the forward part didn't come up until after all of that. And at that point, he even had an agent that he was working with that he was putting me in touch with. And even still at that point, he hadn't written the forward or agreed to it. He said, you need to send me the book so I can read it first. And now that's a key thing because I mentioned relationships. There are some people, if you built that strong of a relationship, they would say, yeah, I'll just, just tell me what the book's about. But he still read the book, went through it, and was able to cite that in the forward. I think that's a credit to him because his integrity and his name was too important because he has a big following of people that trust him that he wasn't going to put his name on it until he was ready. So I, I got to add that in because it wasn't just like we became friends. And they said, yeah, I'll do your forward. It wasn't yeah. a simple one. So good. James is a good human. He's been on the show. He wants to create a series with me and I need to thank you for this because that's like note to self. I need to reach out and make that happen now with him because yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much, um, I feel very connected with him deeply and I feel really connected with that, the work that he's doing. It's, it was timely back then to usher most of us into this conversation of metaphysics and what's possible. I feel like now more than ever, we need his voice. So we're going to, right, we're going to head to a really quick break here and then we'll be back with more with the amazing Corey. I just want to let people know if you have a dream, if you don't want to live with regrets, you know, I teach the ultimate visibility formula. It teaches you how to be interviewed and how to get results on media and it can be done and you can do it really easily and successfully. I also have book writing coaching that's available to you. <clears throat> I, excuse me, I do a lot of private clients and I do a lot of groups. We have different things that are about to roll out. Very exciting. So you can go to my website, debbie-inger.com. And remember, if you spell my name right, you'll get there. It's D-E-B-B-I, D as in David, A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. And here's the current offering. We have people signing up right now. I'm excited about this because I got a download I literally got a download. Debbie, it's time to do another anthology book. I've done them before. Great success. Awesome experience. Love my authors. And I was told I need to do one about dogs. So if you're into canines, I don't care if you work on a canine unit or you're a vet who has some experience with dogs or a service dog, or you have a story of a dog or you're a pet psychic, or I want them all for this book. I am looking for people to write a chapter in a book called Dogs Are Paradise. You can sign up at debbyd.net slash anthology. You'll become a best-selling published author this year, and you won't even have to write an entire book. How does it get any better than that? And how about becoming an international best-selling author this year? Do you have a story to tell? Because if you have a story to tell, we're looking for you. There are authors signing up, and all you do is write a chapter about a dog in this compilation, and it's going to be published this year. Is it time for you to write your tale or your tale? <laughs> Woof. So if you're interested, just register debbid.net slash anthology. That's debbid.net slash anthology. And I'll be thrilled to have you come aboard. I know I attract really the most perfect people. So welcome to the anthology about dogs. <laughs> it's positively perfect. I had to go there. <laughs> I had to go there. Okay. If you're tuning in to Dear to Dream, after we've started, I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am interviewing Corey Poirier. He's a multiple TEDx sought after keynote speaker and author of the new book, The Book of Why. You can find out more at coreypoirier.com. And uh, Corey, in the time we have left, I'm going to see how much we can cover because you really give a lot of value and insight. And I appreciate that so much. You have something called a better life formula. Will you share what that is? Yeah. And I think it's, it's a really good fit for this show because the formula itself What's really neat about it to me is it's, it's all, first of all, intangible stuff. It's very intangible, but it's all stuff that healers fully understand and get, I think, it, which is energy, of course. Uh, so I say that because, you know, not everybody is totally bought in on energy, even though it's been proven. So, and I say this because I talk to, you know, friends I grew up with, they're just like, when I start talking about that, they're like, he's a wizard. What's going on? 
they just, you know, they, they haven't bought in. So, uh, so here's what I've discovered is the better life formula. And what it's in reference to when I say it's the better life formula, it's really what I've discovered that the top influencers, I used to call them the enlightened super achievers, what they do differently than everybody else. And here's the definition of an enlightened super achiever because people used to wonder, well, what type of person do you mean and why that name? And the reason was is because I used to say high achievers and I'd watch the audience. They would get a different vibe or energy. And I was like, what's going on there? And when I surveyed, finally, I'm like, I need to ask this question. Why is this being received negatively? It's because so many people have worked with high achievers that have stepped on other people to get to where they're at. Mm -hmm. So then I started saying, okay, it needs to be enlightened. And, but I still need to get rid of the high achiever. So that's where the super achiever came in. So, but I'll give you an example as far as visually. To me, an enlightened super achiever would be, I mentioned her earlier, but Elisa Nichols, um, Zig Ziglar, uh, Jim, Jim Rohn, the late Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins. And whether people, you know, some people may not be fans or, or are fans, but what I'm getting at, why I say these people is because they don't just get to the top of the mountain. They pull other people up with them. They push other people up in front of them. So to me, that's an enlightened super achiever. And so I wanted to know for those people, Mm -hmm. What is, what, how are they so happy all the time? How are they fulfilled seemingly? How are they, um, you know, how can they walk around and not be, you know, going, the world's going to end whenever they're putting in so much of their energy and time and life into everything they do. And, and of course they're already maxed out. So I'm like, how are they doing this? How are they sort of still having time for yoga and meditation and all these other things? And, and you know, sometimes it's because they do yoga and meditation that they have the extra time, but that's a whole other conversation. But what I discovered in this formula was three things. So the first one is, and this one's the easiest one to say, but maybe the hardest one to get, uh, which is they're living on purpose. And so it's really the core essence of the book is finding your why. So they're living their why. And so, you know, if, if for example, I mentioned for me, it's creating an invisible or visible ripple. Well, for me, when I'm doing that, that's what lights my fire. And that makes me happier. And I think it makes me, um, as a person healthier and I get sick less often and people want to be around me more, I think because of it. And, and I have this high energy that I clearly have without taking anything, <laughs> you know? And so, and I, I actually said in the book, you probably remember is I take vitamin P, which is for passion and purpose. And I say, it's the vitamin you can't buy in the store, but it's the one everybody should be taking. And so the point I'm getting at here is with the, the better life formula, one of those three elements is finding your purpose and your calling. So that's one. And, you know, we can certainly talk more on that if we want to in more depth. Uh, in the book, obviously, I share a strategy for how to do that. The second one is increasing your positive energy. And so when I say positive energy, I mean really your mindset as well, like your positivity. And what I talk about in the formula is actual strategies to do this. Because it's easy to say, be happier, or have a smile on your face, or walk around with a positive energy, or fake it till you make it. But I'm, I'm a believer that there's actual strategy we can do. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if I talk about increasing positive energy, maybe it means every morning when you wake up, you go read a Zig Ziglar quote, you know, just as an example. Or when you wake up, you uh, get on a call with somebody who you know is going to give you some inspirational moment. Or it could mean that you, uh, and this is something I talk about, you actually do an inventory of who you're surrounding yourself with, see who's adding positive, who's adding negative, and make adjustments accordingly. And so if you're surrounding yourself with the right people, that's going to add more positive energy mm. and you know, more positive people, more positive energy. Because I think if you start out with 10 negative people in your life and two positive, you're going to already have an uphill battle before you wake up every day in being a positive person. So increasing your positive energy, I believe there's strategies and I go into a lot of that. The second part is decreasing negative strategies. And so it's kind of the opposite, right? Get rid of the toxic people or at least reduce the time with them because I think some of the challenges sometimes is people only speak in uh, absolutes and I don't think we're always in absolutes. So your mother could be the negative person, but you could love her dearly. Mm. So I'm not saying kick your mother to the curb because she's negative, but I am saying maybe reduce the time you spend with her yeah. or try to switch the conversations back to positive when she's bringing you down the negative manhole. Mm. So for, for the actual formula is essentially finding ways to increase your positive energy. So these enlightened super achievers, they find ways to increase their positive energy pretty much on a daily basis. Jack Canfield's hour of power is an example of doing that. Uh, they find ways to decrease their negative energy. So get rid of, don't, and go on a news detox. That's something I've been talking about for a long time. Go on a news detox, get rid of the negative news. And I actually did a video that I was planning to share. It's kind of timely right now about the importance of, yeah, it's good to be informed. <laughs> But if you know that you're a person that lives in fear when you hear about this stuff, maybe you just find a buddy who doesn't live in fear and say, just give me the stuff I need to know to protect myself. And then don't go and still 
dive into the news and read the front of the newspaper. Yeah. And on the stage, I used to do a dramatic thing where I'd say, if you have to read the newspaper, and I'd rip off the first few pages, I'd say, start there. Because <laughs> all the negative is on the front, right? So that's the second part is decreasing negative. And the final part is finding your calling or your purpose. If you have those three things in place, I think it's going to be very hard for you to actually not be successful, abundant, uh, living a meaningful life. Because again, think about it. You have strategy for decreasing the amount of negativity in your life, strategy for increasing the positivity, and you're living your purpose. I, mean, I don't know if it gets much sweeter than that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, you know, you've brought up some really interesting points and part of what you're talking about and then also referencing today I care about you. I know you make a living speaking. I also know this time we are living in, which are very interesting, unheard of, unprecedented on some level, times. I'm curious if you don't mind to share, how is this impacting you in your career? How are you speaking? How are you making money? What's going on? So I, I would love, okay, so I'm gonna give you a, 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 a unique answer to this question. Because I would love to tell you, Debbie, because I think it would be a sexier answer and it would maybe even help more people. I would love to tell you that um, the answer is that I, you know, I found this way to still do a live booking, even though nobody's doing live events, you know, or, or whatever, get paying them to maybe send me there and I'm speaking to their staff via satellite. But here's what happened. And again, if you believe in mysterious coincidences, if you believe that there's synchronicities, for the first time in 18 years as a paid speaker, who's pretty much spoken three times a week for most of those years. For the first time, because I'm launching a new brand, I had shifted gears and I purposely was turning down bookings and actually handing them to students. So for the first time ever, I didn't want bookings. And I hate to say it, but I'm seeing so many people, colleagues of mine that are losing 10 and 15 and 20 bookings all at once, like literally in one week. And so what's happened with me is we're, we have a, a brand called Blue Talks that we've, we're still actually launching next month. We still haven't officially launched, but it's similar to TEDx. And we've run three events. In fact, whenever we were last together at the New Media Summit, I was shoving off to do the first one of those. And so what we've done is we went around and filmed about 40 speakers. We're, we have a whole, we have six events planned this year, but they're all at the end of the year. That even worked out that way. But um, so those, we're getting those videos ready to start sharing. Uh, we're launching a podcast with it and a, and a book series. Uh, so all centered around this brand. So I needed the time to launch this brand and launch my book of why. And so I didn't book stuff for the first time in forever. And so it actually, it meant that I didn't lose a whole bunch of bookings. Now, in fairness, as a speaker, a lot of people don't know this, but I will answer the question for some of the speakers out there. They'll still be okay for one reason. If they've set themselves up like this, which is one of the things I teach in my program, is you need to get a deposit. And so for some of these speakers, let's say they had 40 bookings booked for the next two months that are canceled, they would have gotten paid half of that already. Hmm. And because of the circumstances, very unlikely that the client's going to ask for it back when they know they're canceling on the speaker. A lot of clients have been really good to say, well, they'll pay the airfare, even if the speaker had paid it and was going to get paid later. So, but here's the catch with that. And you know how this works. It, it, the catch is they would have had to have put that money aside. So if they've already spent that deposit money, then it's going to be a lot harder. But what I'm saying is if they uh, got that deposit money, so 50% of all those 40 bookings, and they didn't blow through all that money, then they'll still have a little bit to carry them through until they start getting bookings again. And then the other light at the end of the tunnel, which is more important than that, because you know it's easy to say that, but we never know when a circumstance is going to come up. So we might not be saving for a rainy day. Maybe we're investing in a new home or who knows. But the other side is once this the dust settles and it will. I put a quote up the other day and said, uh, in times like these, it's always helpful to remember there have always been times like these. Yes. And it wasn't my quote, it's somebody else's, but um, it's, and the quote's probably from a hundred years ago, I don't know. But you know, there's been the plague, there's been the black death, I think they there's call it. There's been HIV in our lifetime. There's been yeah. SARS and Mercer, the bird flu, the swine flu, more death. So, the thing about it is, is that my experience, things almost always get, I'm just talking now a business perspective, but things almost mm -hmm. always get stronger right afterward. Mm -hmm. The other side is I think we get stronger as people going through it. Yeah. But when I say they always get stronger, if you think about the speaking business, here's what I think is going to happen. The only catch is when are events going to be back on again? But when they are, 
you're going to have a whole bunch of new bookings because you're going to have clients that didn't get to run their event. They're going to be super pumped and craving speakers and live events. You're going to have people that are craving live events that want to go and buy tickets to events where people are running their own event. And then the other side, which is a big one, is those speakers like me. I did have some bookings that were booked like two and a half years ago that got impacted. And most of those clients came and said, we're postponing it. And we hope later this year, you'll still be available. But who's to say I'm going to be available? Right. So if I'm not, that means that's a brand new booking for another speaker who lost one. Mm. So I think as long as this comes back around within a few months or six months, I think what's going to happen, you're going to see, is speaking is going to get busier. The only catch to that is obviously it depends what the economy looks like after. So that was a long way to say I'm optimistic that, um, that people will come through this stronger, even speakers. But I'm also, uh, you know, I'm aware of the fact that right now it's a really hard time. For speakers. I mean, I have students in my program who won just the other day said she lost five bookings in one day. I mean, that's depending on what fee level you're at, because some people don't know speakers fees. But I mean, that's I'll say in her case, because I'm not saying her name, that's about 28 to $30,000 gone in one day. I mean, that's that's somebody's, you know, mortgage payment for five months. Yeah. So again, so you asked me how I'm dealing with it. I I, and I, won't, I don't really like using the word lucky, but for whatever reason, whether it was intuition or it just was a happenstance, but I wasn't focused on that for the first time in 18 years. And, and I, so the answer though, the bigger answer is I have revenue coming in from other ways. I've always had multiple streams. So I have other revenue that was coming in that was planned so that it wouldn't impact things. And uh, so I had that happen, but for other people, uh, they're really, they're just having to try to find their way through it. Uh, I do will say that some of my other students had, other um, business, let's say, uh, business models they had that were running as well, and that's what they're relying on now, but it's not easy, is the right. short answer. Yeah, for most people, and I, I just, Corey and I were saying at the beginning, and I want to say this to everybody um, who this is really inspiring and helping right now, and I believe it will, <clears throat> you know, it's really important how you show up right now. As sensitive beings, we can all sense the anxiety. We can all sense the fear. This is impacting us on so many levels. I personally feel really isolated, I will tell you. And as someone who's a great connector and relationship person, I do work from home. I live from home, right? My office is here. It's me and a dog. And I broke up with my boyfriend on Sunday because it was the right thing to do, right? Yeah. And at the same time, that's a pretty dramatic move to make at a time when people are looking for anchors. And where I've had events, I was supposed to starting this Friday, week after week, I have all these bookings that just cancel, cancel, cancel. One of them was a course that now I won't be able to attend that I'm really looking forward to as I explore my healing abilities. And now they're offering it online. And for someone like me, I don't have ADHD. It's a joke. But I mean, I kind of have ADHD. It's really tough for me to stay present when I'm not in person. So I know it's tough times, health, loved ones, careers, finances, where are you going to get food and, you know, people hoarding things and there's a lot going on. I think kindness is the word of the day. You know, really show up as who you always dreamed of being because thinking about that in good times, well, that's awesome practice. But this is the time. This is truly the litmus of your soul's being. Who are you going to be today? Who Are you going to let someone go in front of you? Are you going to smile? Are you going to help? Are you going to hold the energy? I even have, and this is zero judgment, zero, because these are uber sensitive people. I have a lot of profound healers who are coming to me right now because they are so compacted by the anxiety, it's now taking them over. And I'm actually doing sessions for them because that's how we have to show up for each other. So I wanna tell you that this week, somebody just not even knowing, took a bunch of beautiful cards and put them in envelopes and happened to send this to me. And I gotta tell you, this is, I don't know if you could see it and I'll try to figure out where to put it so that it like resonates. But oh, I, yeah, I, I can see it. It says, stand your ground. And, and it's a beautiful angel, um, you know, fairy with a wand and all of that. And this has been really meaningful to me to hold on to, to stand my ground, stand in the being of who I am, not sway. Like, and I'm doing healing practices every day to not get sucked up in the tsunami of fear. And it's great because when I come out of this, I'm going to have some really powerful daily practices. So Corey, 
I'm going to end on that note. This is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? So, well, I have, I, I mentioned, I think we mentioned it during the interview and not just off air, but uh, my girlfriend is five months pregnant. And we have a two and a half year old as well. So this is an interesting time for us because even on the hoarding side, I couldn't even find hand sanitizer for her. And she's obviously, her immune system's lower being pregnant. I mean, so it's, it's a unique time we're in. But, you know, for me, I'm very optimistic and as a person by nature, uh, and I always, wasn't always, I was a hypochondriac. I think I mentioned it in the book, uh, which by the way, it probably comes back to why I talk about how important it is to go on a news detox because somebody who feels energy or they're a hypochondriac, I mean, this stuff can destroy them. I mean, I know I lived it. And so, and I wasn't even living it during this time, but I know how powerful it is. So for me, I'm an optimist now and I feel we're going to come out of the stronger and I actually feel I don't want to say sooner rather than later, because I think some people are thinking next weekend, everything's going to be back to normal. And I'm not that optimistic. But, you know, I see with my, you know, by fall, uh, I think events are going to be running full, this is my opinion, going to be running actually at a high level, maybe even too high a level, because there's going to be not enough people to fill that. Uh, so our event, I'm really excited about that. My dream is to really impact a lot of lives with this Blue Tox brand. And I think it's really timely because Blue Tox, Blue stands for business life universe. And so the universe was the catalyst that started this talk. And really, I think that's where the, the talk is going to help so many people is on the universe side, people coming up and talking about synchronicities and talking about uh, NLP and Reiki and healing. And so I guess for me, I'm dreaming that this branded talk series is going to start changing lives immediately. And I think it's the right time for it. It's free. It costs nobody anything to watch the videos or listen. And I'm excited for the speakers involved because of how many people they can impact. But I'm also excited for what it can do for the world in the time when we think, I think we need it the most. So that was a long answer. Is it Corey? So for those who want to get involved, CoreyPorier.com or is it a different website for that? So with Blue Talks, and it's just, I mean, we're so new, it's being launched as we speak. So it might, it'll be up within the next week. Cool. Um, so just go to your website and then we'll follow what you're doing there. Yeah, well, I would go to, my other website is thatspeakerguy.com. Okay. So going there has my, uh, my TEDx talks and articles and stuff, but it also has my social media. Uh, so that's where you'll see the updates because I'm active on all of the social media channels. Uh, but I'll just leave this out there too, is bluetalks.com, blue without the E, is what the website's going to be in the next week or so. Beautiful. And that's speakerguide.com. Corey, I adore you. Thank you for coming on the show today, being with me and the listeners. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's my absolute pleasure. And thank you for all the good you're doing in the world as well. Mm. I end today's show with this. Dare to do what you dare to dream. Success comes to those that dare to dream dreams and are foolish enough to try and make them come true. It is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Dare to dream of your great success, and as I like to say, and then dare to take action on it. Tune in to these upcoming interviews and in inspiring interviews. You can subscribe to the Dare to Dream pad podcast, my goodness, <laughs> to the Dare to Dream podcast and hear this weekly number one transformation conversation. My upcoming guest is Leah Dunlap, who is the mystical oracle. I'm super excited to have her on. She's pretty connected. And subscribe to the YouTube videos at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Absolutely dream. It is still your time. Sometimes time of crisis is also a time of great opportunity. What is yours?